Until 2.30 this morning, the Lord began to speak to me about uh, a subject that I am contemplating writing a book on. And um, uh, I want you to know that it's a, it's a very difficult subject to face, but it's something that's happening in the church today. And if we're not aware of what's going to happen, God is going to still hold us accountable even if we don't know it. Amen. I want to, uh, for a moment, uh, look up, I believe it's Proverbs 14. I just got to get it. I had it written on my phone, something extra that I had put in there. Let me get it right here. Proverbs 14, verse 12. If you could put that up on the screen before I get into my message this morning. Uh, this is a scripture that many of us quote, but many of us, very few of us, will pay attention to. It says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. Say it with me. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that seems right unto man. Man always wants to be right. Who likes to be wrong? Nobody likes to be wrong. Everyone likes to be right. But there are times when we must face the facts that we are not correct or we're not right, and we need to repent and ask God for forgiveness. Amen? There is a way which seems right. In other words, to a man, they think that everything's right and their way that they're going and the things that they're doing and the things that they're, they're working on is right. But the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto man. There's, there's something in man that just says, uh, I'm okay and I'm just going to do what I want to do and that's fine. But the end of that way is what? It is destruction. Now, what has happened in the church today, and you're going to see this as I unfold this uh, message today, I want to share with you my message today. Make us a God that we can worship. Make us a God that we can worship. Postmodern philosophy of the 21st century. Make us a God that we can worship. Society today is crying out to uh, form a God that they can worship, that is, there is no uh, personal commitment or personal conviction or personal uh, uh, conviction of what is right and what is wrong, but they want a God today that will soothe their flesh and soothe the way of carnality. Make us a God that we can worship. Now, if you want, would you please turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 32. We're going to be uh, sharing some scripture today, so if you have a pen, please take it out and write some of these things down. Or you can go on our website, www.forhisglorychristianassemblyca.org, uh, and get the messages right on our website. We want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. We want to say good, uh, good day to Brother Sajeev up in India. He's watching right now. He just texted me before as I was sitting in my chair, and uh, he said uh, he's joining us through the Facebook this morning, all the way in India. Isn't that wonderful? And he's watching this morning, and others may be joining in as we go along. And, and uh, praise God, Linda, I believe, up in Maine is, is joining us this morning. God bless you. Good to have you with us. And uh, today's subject is one of that's very, very uh, pressing on my spirit lately. Uh, make us a God that we can worship. It's not something God just inspired me this morning at 2.30 to, to speak on it, but it's been going over in my spirit for months and months and months now. And it's a postmodern philosophy of this 21st century because most of the churches that are starting today have this philosophy. And uh, as I was sharing with Pastor Ron Sutton, as he came a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and he spoke here, we had some great time of fellowship, and he wrote a book, Devil on the Front Row. If you got a copy of that, you should read it, uh, how the devil will feel most comfortable in a lot of the churches in America today. The devil could be sitting right there on the front row and not be disturbed at all at what goes on in a lot of churches today. And I'm not here to bash any church, and I'm not here to bash anything that, uh, that is spiritually, spiritually led by the Holy Spirit, but I'm here to warn you, as the Scripture says, the Scripture was given for inspiration, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Say amen, somebody, so I don't get lonely up here. 
Exodus chapter 32, starting with verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Heavenly Father, we just pray this morning for your enlightenment, for your anointing, Father, to fall upon your word, God, as we expound it today. God, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide me. Lord, as I speak your word, and that not only those that are here in the assembly, but those who are listening far far away in many lands, God, in many ways, listening to this message. I pray, God, that you will enlighten their soul and enlighten their minds, that, God, they will come and see the era of this philosophy of the 21st century. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. The, the Bible says, and when the people saw that Moses delayed. Now, I want to say something about Moses. Moses was an old man. Moses was in his 80s when God began to use him. And so Moses was up there in age. And I want you to understand this morning that a lot of times when the people come and they're gathered together, they're not always gathered together for unity. Sometimes people come together because they, they're very opinionated and they want to cause division. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, how many know that God's time is different than our time? I know that there are some times in the church people that can't wait for the church to be over. They can't wait for Sunday morning to be over so they can rush out of here and go home into a safe place. Can I get a good amen? People want to run out of churches today. They, want, they don't want to communicate. They don't want to uh, associate with anybody in the church. But God has created us as beings to intermingle, to be intertwined together as a body of believers. Now, a lot of people don't like it when God delays. They always want things on their timetable, in their way, and the, and the way that they want it done, when it shall, when it could be done. They don't want to wait upon the Lord. And I can tell you this right now from experience. I've seen more Holy Ghost movements in churches after the service was over as, as people tarried at the altar. We're so interested in grabbing our Bibles and running out the door because we have an agenda and we have so many things we have to do. But I want you to understand that in these last days, God's going to make it a, a, a requirement of you to give an account for your life. The Bible says that every idle word that man shall speak, he will give an account for. Every idle word, every word that you don't think God hears, you'll give an account for before God. So if he's going to judge every idle word, he's going to judge every idle work also. Come on, somebody give me an amen. Give me, come on, this ain't the cemetery. This is a church, hallelujah. You should be excited to hear God's word. So the people saw that Moses delayed to come down. In other words, Moses didn't come when they wanted him to. They didn't come, he didn't come down when they thought it was long enough that he was up there in that mountain talking to God who they never saw before with their physical eyes. He delayed in their mind to come down out of the mountain. So what they did was they gathered themselves together. How many know that misery loves company? How many know that there, there, there seems to be power or there seems to be a unity when you gather yourselves together? When you've got one, more than one person on your side, amen, for your argument. And I'm reminded of the prophet Elisha on Mount Carmel when he had 850 false prophets. Think about it. 850 false prophets against him. One against 850. <laughs> Those odds seem kind of self-defeating. But I want you to know that one with God is a majority. I want you to know that one with God is a majority. And I'm going to tell you, when my wife and I were standing on Mount Carmel up there in, in Israel, 
And we look down into the valley of Jezreel. Hallelujah. That's where the false prophets were slain and killed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's going to begin to slay the false prophets that are going around. And you need to take authority over those voices that you hear in your mind. And take authority and kill those false prophets. Amen. So they came down. They gathered themselves together. They didn't just gather themselves together. But they gathered themselves together to a person. A person named Aaron. Aaron was a high priest. Called in the Levitical priesthood. Called to represent God. Can I tell you that? That Aaron was called by God to represent him before the people. They gathered themselves to a man of God. But I want you to understand that this man of God, this man Aaron, had a character flaw. He had a weakness. And his weakness was pleasing people. If anyone wants to be a leader in God's church, the first thing you must learn, whether you go to Bible college or you go to seminary, is that if you are truly called of God, you are a man of God, you are not going to be a people pleaser. That you're not in it to make people happy. You're not going to give people what they need. You're going to, uh, what they want. You're going to give people what they need. Because sometimes... For the sake of crowds, ministers will give the people what they want rather than what they need because they don't want to lose finances. They only are interested in building their kingdoms, their portfolios of ministry, how successful they look in the eyes of man. But I remember my former pastor, George, Dr. George Cootie. He said this a few times, and it stuck with my heart. He was from India. He was a great man of God. He wasn't perfect, but he was a great man of God, and he still is today. He said, I'd rather have 10 oak trees than 100 palm trees. The oak trees are solid, solidified, stable. They're not going anywhere. But the palm trees, they sway back and forth with every wind. Some of them are very easily uprooted. And here these people gathered themselves because they were impatient. They didn't want to wait for God. And can I say that this is what's happening in this postmodern 21st century philosophy. People don't want to wait anymore. They don't want to endure. They don't want to press through. They want it now. Right now, instant. Everything, everywhere you go, it's instant. Go to McDonald's. It's fast food. It's drive through. Burger King, have it your way. Everything is instant now. We want it quick. We want it fast. We want it. There's even, I believe, down south, there's even a drive through church. You drive like the drive throughs in the old days. You drive through, put the speaker on your glass and think. You sit there, it comes on the screen, the preacher preaches a message, they come around and make a collection, 25, 30 minutes, and then you just put the speaker back after you're done and you go home. They have a fast food lane called fast prayer. You go, you go through the drive through you roll your window down, you, the, the people will pray with you and you give them an offering and then you can go on your way. Everything is fast, everything is done out of their own time, they have no time for God. And that's the truth. People are more and more, as, the, as I see the end times coming, people more and more and more have less and less time for God. So they gathered themselves unto Aaron, and I've got to move on here. And they said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. In other words, they want a God that is fashioned according to their likeness, according to their image. Make us a God. That will go up before us. But something else has happened also. In their conspiracy to overthrow the God divinely appointed leadership, they begin to attack the man of God. 
As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. He's gone. And Aaron, man of God, we have two men of God. We have Moses, who's up there getting the word of God, getting the instruction of God, getting the revelation of God, getting the inspiration of God. He's up there fasting and praying, waiting for God to form the commandments so that the people will know how to live. But the people don't want to wait for that. The people want, make us a God that will go before us. Make us a God that will go before us. We don't know what's become of this Moses. And so Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters. Bring them unto me. And all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a grave. I'm sorry. Uh, let me read that again. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. He formed an idol. What was the first commandment that God gave to Moses? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. God has a perspective. God has a pre-qualifier there. They didn't wait for God, and so they were not doing God's business. They were doing their business. They weren't concerned about what God said. They were concerned about what they wanted. Make us a God. So Aaron, the weak leader that he was, fashioned this false God in their image. I'm going to talk for a moment and let you know this is the same philosophy of the postmodern Christianity that's up today in this 21st century. This is the ideology of the seeker friendly movement the seeker-friendly churches that are building churches by the thousands. This is their philosophy. When they begin to construct these churches, this is how they did it. A bunch of people came together and they started surveys. And they went to people's houses that were not even Christians. And they went to their house. And they said, excuse me, Mr. Abreu. Please tell me, what is it that keeps you from not going to church? I don't like the color. Uh, I don't like the color behind the altar. Okay, doesn't like the color behind the altar. Mrs. Abreu, what do you do not like about the church that keeps you from church? Oh, I don't like the way... Uh, that they have a cross hanging on the thing. It just reminds me of death. Okay, no cross. Okay, and, and Mr. Fabio, what is it that you don't like about going to church? And what would you, what would you change it to, that would allow you to come to church? Well, I, I don't like the, the, the worship teams. I don't, I don't like the choir. Uh, you know, okay, doesn't like choir. And, and uh, Miss Jeanette, what is it that you don't like about church that you would come to church if there was things changed? Well, I, I don't like the pulpit. The, the pulpit's too scary. It reminds me of the olden days where they had fire and brimstone being preached. So if you remove the pulpit, I'll come to church. And what they do is they, they go and they, they survey a couple of thousand people in the, in the area. And then what they do is they feed all of this information into a computer. And when the computer gets all this information, it deciphers it into the church that you should build for that community. And they build the church according to the computer generation. 
of information. And then they send cards out to all the people. And they say, we have built you a church just like you want. This body of Israelites that we're talking about this morning have done the same thing. The philosophy is the same. Make us a God that we can worship. Oh, it's getting quiet, Joe. And then they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, when he finally was able to look at the thing that he created, he built an altar. before it. This is very important now. He built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and he said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. He was acknowledging God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he was acknowledging the one true God, but what he has done now is he has corrupted the worship service. He has corrupted the commitment to God by offering these offerings in this festival to an idol and through the idol to Jehovah. Are you, are you following me? They were using this golden calf in their thinking and in their spirit to worship God, the one true God, through this idol. Thinking that they're still worshiping the God of heaven. But can I tell you they were not. What they were worshiping through this idol, they were worshiping demons. You cannot go before God through idols. You cannot make it to God through idols. He said, you will have no other gods before me. You've got to take all of these other gods out of the way, and you have a direct link right to God through Jesus Christ. And they rose up early in the morning. Oh, it's so funny how people will rise up early in the morning to worship a false god. It's so easy for people to rise up early to go and worship the god of fishing. They'll get up 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning to go get their poles and go to the boat and get out on the lake in time for the morning fishing. Or you're going on a trip, or you're going on vacation, or you're going somewhere. You'll get up 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning, to, so you can get to the airport in time to get on the plane to go on vacation. But to come to church, you can't even come to church at 10 o'clock. You come tw 20 past, 25 past, 10, 30, quarter of. Come on. What God are you worshiping? What God are you worshiping? Are you making a God after your own image, after your own likeness, what you think, versus what God reveals in His Word? They rose up early on the morning. And look, they offered burnt offerings, and they brought peace offerings. These were the two offerings that they brought, the Israelites brought to the priest, and the priest would offer these offerings to Jehovah God. So they were in keeping with the very ritual that they were supposed to do, but they were doing it according to their own thinking, according to the God that they were making after their own image, after their own likeness. 
And then it says, and the people sat down and to drink and to rose up to play and to eat. Oh, let me put it this way. The people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. What is the one thing you're seeing in these seeker-friendly churches today? They're eating and drinking in the sanctuary. Oh, They're eating and drinking in the sanctuary, the place that's God's house, the place where you come to worship the one true God. And they're coming in, eating their donuts, eating their sandwich, drinking their coffee, drinking their Coca-Cola, in the assembly. And the priest, Aaron, is allowing it to go forth. Just like the Bible says. And they rose up to play. I've seen some of these Worship services, so-called, that they have. Supposedly worshiping God with balls bouncing like, like in a stadium when they're in a, in a football game or a baseball game. They have these inflatable balls and they bounce them to one another and they're passing these balls together. Then they have the light sticks. They break the light sticks and they're flashing the light sticks. And the, the lights are flashing here, flashing there. The smoke is coming up from the, from the altar of their burnt offerings and sacrifices to a false god. And they will tell you, oh, we're worshiping the one true God. We're worshiping God. Yes, we are. No, you're not. Just like they did in the children of Israel. They're worshiping a false god. Or they're worship, trying to worship God that they have created after their own image, after their own likeness. When people get away from God and get away from the word, this is what you get. People eating and drinking and playing in the church. Oh, some people are not going to like me on Facebook. But that's okay. I'm not here to be popular. I'm not here to have the biggest, largest church. Believe me, I know how to do it. I know how to create a large church. It's done through one word called compromise. For the sake of money, for the sake of prestige, for the sake of social acceptability, for the sake of being called a successful ministry and preacher. But let me be very clear on this one point. I never have been and I never will be an Aaron. Oh, Rabba, Shikaraba. I'll never be an Aaron. And the day I become an Aaron, I pray God will drop me dead right behind the pulpit. And I mean that with every sincerity of my heart. I am not called to be a professional preacher. I'm here to call the word of God into place. Many of you will not like it. Many of you will fight it. Many of you will torture it. You'll twist it to your own liking to make a God that you can serve. But let me tell you. You are worshiping someone that you have created and not the God of this Bible. Oh, Rabasha. I need some water, someone. Who will go for me? George, please, thank you. My good friend. He's got a shirt on that says, World's greatest dad, but that's not true. God is the greatest dad. My second point to my message this morning is this. Come, brother. Put right there. People begin to think that they have they have the word of God just like their pastor. Look at Numbers uh, chapter 12, verse 2. Numbers 12, verse 2.
Numbers 12, verse 2. And they said, Hath the Lord spoken only by Moses? Hath he spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. In other words, people today, hey, the Lord speaks through me too. Not only through the pastor, but he speaks through me too. They have this idea. But you need to read the context here. It's not that God doesn't speak to everyone. But there are certain ones who are not listening. They're listening to, the own, they're listening to their own voice. Forming a God after their own likeness of what they think. And interpreting that and serving the God that they think rather than the God of the Bible. It'd be foolish for me, and I'll use this as an example because it's, it's, it's right here in front of us. It's foolish for me to put an apron on and go to Charlie's Pizza and begin to make chicken Alfredo the way he makes it. I don't even know what's in it. But you will not get the same thing that he has, believe me. You may go, <laughs> what happened to Charlie's Alf Chicken Alfredo? Well, because I can cook just like he does. No, you can't. I can tell you recipes that my mom made that even Linda cannot duplicate. You know when they make a meal that is just so good, but you, you can go, try to make it a thousand times, it never comes out the same. Look for a moment with me, please, to Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 to 14. Now Korah, the son of Izzah, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, Sons of Reuben took men. Always notice that. They took men. They took men of renown. They took men and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princesses of the assembly. In other words, the best solid Christians. Famous in the congregation, men of renown. Well respected. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy. See? See the attitude? We're all holy. We're all the same. Look at the philosophy of the postmodern 21st century church. We're all the same. There's no difference between a pastor and a, and a congregant. You can't even tell the difference. You go today, the pastor's got torn jeans, his knees are sticking out, he's got a shirt hanging, hanging out, sleeves rolled up. He's just there. He's just talking. Isn't that the truth? There's no distinction. But didn't God command the priests, the Levites, to dress in a holy garment of consecration? To show that they were different? We should dress different. We should be respectful. We should come to church with the best that we have. Whether that be a pair of jeans but nicely pressed. Gentlemen with their shirts tucked in. We don't, re we don't command that someone preach on Wednesday night with a tie. But come respectfully. Your pastor should be dressing on Sunday morning respectfully of the office that he holds. I mean, come on, President Trump can't even go to a, a disaster area wearing a, a, his clothes that he wore without being criticized. What do you want him to do? Go, go there as a president in, in a three-piece suit? 
Then his wife wears uh, stilettos on the plane, and they're all criticizing her stilettos. Because they ain't got nothing better to talk about, but when she gets off the plane, she's got her sneakers. Do you take too much on yourself, Moses? See, they call us preachers that preach this truth old-fashioned. We're old-fashioned. We're not with the times. We're divisive. No, we're not divisive. They are. Because they're sucking in our young people by the hundreds. Why? Because the kids today don't want commitment. Now, I'm not talking about commitment to a church. I'm talking about commitment to God. My Bible says, desire the old paths. So here they come against Moses, right? And it says, wherefore they lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Why are you, why are you doing that, Moses? You make yourself more important than you really are. And when Moses heard it, he hired, a, uh, he hired Jay Sekulow of the American Center for Law and Justice and sued them. Is that what Moses did? Come on. No, he fell upon his face. He worshipped God. You know the story. God opened up the earth and the earth swallowed them up. Look at 1 Kings for a moment, chapter 12. Starting with verse 26. Do you know that in the Old Testament when they restored the temple? You know how long the church service was? 18 hours. Six hours they prayed, six hours they worshipped, six hours they got the word. Oh, Pastor, you're preaching too long. You've been preaching now for half an hour. That's the other thing. Don't preach too long to the people. Don't preach. Preach 25-minute box message. Be a motivational speaker. Uplift them. Bring them up. Well, the only way you can bring them up is to first bring them down. They're all full of themselves. We're all full of ourselves. We need to humble ourselves. That's bringing yourself down. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. But then Jeroboam. Jeroboam thought this. It won't be long before the kingdom is reunited under David. As soon as these people resume the worship at the temple of God in Jerusalem, They'll start thinking of Rehoboam, king of Judah, as their ruler. They'll come and kill me. And they'll go back to King Reuben. Verse 28. So the king came up with a plan. He made what? Two golden calves. Then he announced, it's too much trouble for you. It's too much trouble for you to go to Jerusalem and worship. It's too much trouble. It's too much trouble for you to go to those old-fashioned churches that are in church for two hours. It's too much trouble. It's too much trouble for you to come dressed halfway decent to church. It's too much trouble. To behold the, 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 their God. The gods of it. It's too much trouble. You know, which brought you out of the land. It's too much trouble. And then he says, he put one calf in Bethel. Do you know what Bethel means? Bethel means house of God. He put a calf in God's house. And this is after the revelation of the Ten Commandments. It just shows you the heart of man disregards God's word. They disregard it. I know that's what God's word says, but I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to go where I want to go, and I'm going to 
worship the way that I want to worship, and if God doesn't like it, too bad for him. That's the attitude. And the other he put in Dan. This was blatant sin. Uh oh. You mean they put an idol, false worship, in God's house? With the bouncy balls and the breaking lights and taking away the altar and taking away the pulpit and taking away the cross and painting everything black? And putting in the pink and the, the blue lights and the white flashing lights and the smoke and all of those things that you find in nightclubs and in concerts. They worship. The people went to worship. Hello? That wasn't the end. Jeroboam built forbidden shrines. Come on, somebody. All over the place. Shrines were little representatives of the main. See, for those who couldn't come that far, they built little shrines. Same philosophy today. They may not be able to go to the main church, so we'll build campuses. We'll build little shrines. Hello? We'll build shrines. All over the place. Look at this. Come on, somebody. Next verse, Pastor Tom, please. He made a house of high places. Listen to what this says here. And that, that wasn't the end of it. Jeroboam built forbidden shrines all over the place and recruited priests from wherever he could find them, regardless of whether they were fit for the job or not. That's a new, new translation. In other words, and they made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. In other words, the sons of Levi were called by God. But he made priests out of them, of the lowest people, the least qualified to interpret the word. Now I'm going to give you an example. Some of you are not going to like me, but I still love you. When Joe Olstein's wife was preaching, she said, it was when the Spirit of God came on Jesus that he became the Son of God. No. He was the Son of God way before that. But here's someone in leadership. Someone in leadership that should know better. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He always was God. He never had to become God. He was God. And he always will be God. But I bet you that went over so many people's heads. And you say, these people are supposed to be leaders in the church, leading people in the paths of righteousness. And all they're doing is just telling you how good you are. Your best life now 
Really? This is my best life? No. 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 My life is not... See, that's a whole different foreign kind of Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. The biblical Christianity is what Jesus said in Matthew 10. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. And if any man is not willing to do that, he cannot be my disciple. That's biblical Christianity. If you're not willing to die to self every single day of your life, you're not worthy of the Lord. It's not this easy believism. Say one little tiny prayer and that's it and you're all set. That's a lie. That's fashioning a golden calf according to your thinking. Oh, my good works will get me into heaven. No, your good, good works are as filthy rags in the sight of God. How you get to heaven is through the shed blood of Jesus. He died on the cross for you, not your good works. The blood of Jesus is sufficient. They took of the lowest, the lowest of the qualified people. They called preachers like myself and others that preach about doctrine. Legalists, Pharisees. Still in bondage. But I'll tell you one thing. And I believe this from the bottom of my heart. And I remember what Bob Lewis said before he left. Behind this pulpit. He said, brother, thank you for giving me such a solid foundation that I won't be deceived. And I believe in my heart that's what I have given you all these years. is a solid foundation so that when the time comes, it's going to get worse, by the way. There's even more and more deception coming. Churches are caving in to the uh, transgender, homosexual uh, lifestyle. I heard a story, I won't mention names, but I heard a story. Two college professors, they have a little boy. They're going to let him grow up and decide whether he's a boy or he's a girl. Think about that. They're going to let him decide. If he wants to wear girls' clothes or boys' clothes, whatever he wants to do. That is so outrageous. But look at the philosophy and, and the ideology behind it. It's preparing the world to be in a place where they don't even know who they are anymore. How are they going to ever know who God is? Read Romans 1. God will send them strong delusion that they would believe a lie. Why? Because they love not the truth nor the way of salvation. And God gave them up to their unnatural lusts, one for another. Men working with men, women working with women. Not knowing the destruction that is before them. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end of that way is destruction. Going back to uh, 1 Kings 12, 31 to 33. And to top it off, I'm using a different translation. He created a holy year festival to be held on the 15th day of the 8th month to replace the one in Judah, the house of praise. That's what Judah means. Complete with worship offered on the altar at Bethel. And sacrificing before the calves he had set up there. He staffed Bethel with priests from the local shrines he had made. This was strictly his own idea to compete with the feast in Judah. And he carried it off with flair, a festival exclusively for Israel. Jeroboam himself 
leading the worship at the altar. You know, there was a, a thing called ethics, Christian ethics. A friend of mine, pastor friend of mine, informed me as I was with him this week that right across the street there's some land and another church is moving in and they're going to build a church right across the street from his church. Now, some of you may have the ideology, well, that's, his, that's their business. They can do that if they want to. No, there was a thing called Christian ethics. When you go into ministry, you wouldn't build a church right across the street, right across from another one. I'm talking about a biblical church. I'm not talking about someone who's not even qualified to be in that position. I'm talking about a, a genuine church preaching genuine doctrine with genuine leadership. Especially when that church came from a split from another church. Hello? Men are doing what's right in their own eyes. But the end of that way is destruction. Why are they choosing that? Well, of course, we all know deception. But how many know that the wisdom of this world is devilish? James chapter 3 talks about that. That there's an, there's an earthly wisdom that men have That they put together all this. That's what they did in the seeker friendly movement. They got the wisdom of unsaved people and said, what it was. So, what is happening now is the churches are filled with unsaved people who think they are saved or think they are Christians because they go to church. But there's been no true conversion. But to the world, to the world, to some of the church, they look successful. He's got to be right. Look at this church. It's 45,000 people. He's got to be right. I said, so the majority makes it right. Yes, that's their answer. So my question to them is, okay, well, what happened during the time of Noah? There was millions of people on the earth. They were the majority. Can I tell you something? The government does not set forth truth. Truth comes from God, not the government. And when the government goes against the word of God, I'm not going with the government. Sorry. You hear me on Facebook there? I will not side myself with ungodly principles of government that are going contrary to the Word of God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I will not call a boy a girl and a girl a boy. Now, they have all the freedom in the world. They have a free choice. They have, you know, they have freedom of choice. God gave that gift to man, freedom to choose. They can choose whatever they want, but they cannot make me say that that's a girl when it's a boy. They cannot make me say that's a boy when it's a girl. You can do whatever you want. You're free to make that choice. But you are not going to implement on me and stifle my choice of believing what I believe. Not going to happen. But you know what? The church is asleep. The real church is asleep. And they're allowing these things to creep in slowly but surely, slowly but surely. Slowly but surely. They made priests of the lowest of the people, the least qualified. You ask people, what do you believe? Oh, we don't judge anybody. We're not to judge. How many times have you heard that? Don't judge. We're not to judge. Oh, that church is a judging church. You know, they judge everything. That church is a condemning church. They condemn everything. Have you been there? No. That's what I heard. I mean, I've been accused of beating my people. You're laughing, but it's true. 
Somebody, I heard it recently, somebody said that I beat my people. Do I beat you? That's sad. You know, the Bible says, my closest friend, the one that was in my bosom, rose up his heel against me. Somebody I know, that I love, and I've helped. Linda of help. I told that to another minister friend of mine. He beats his people. I challenge that person, if you're watching, come and ask all these people that are here this morning if I beat them. It's not true. But think of how your pastor felt when he heard that. That someone's maliciously gossiping, slandering, in saying that. But you want to know something? God told me that he would make my head like flint. And sometimes people bang off my head, and we will bang heads together. And I might get a little tough and a little rough, not with everybody, but certain people that want to push my buttons. I can, I can, go, with the, I can go with the best rounds with you. But the thing about me is this. I don't walk away angry, unforgiving, resentful, or bitter. I walk away with my arms held open to hug you and to say we can disagree. We can yell and scream at each other. Come on. But we're still brothers and sisters. Now, those are the only ones that like to aggravate me on purpose. Most of you have never, never gone into a headbutt with me. You probably never will. What kind of church are they looking for? A church that they can rule and reign? Believe me, they will be the most unsuccessful pastors and leaders in the church. Make us a God that we can worship. What do you expect from your church? What is the standard that you set in your church? Is it a high standard? Or is it a standard that's brought low because you don't want to live up to that standard? Are you one that when you come to church, you don't just come to a building? You just don't come to a place, an address? But when you come into the church because you are the church, and you say, Pastor, what do you need? What do you need done? I'm seeking God for my gifts. Can you pray with me? Can you, can you come and pray with me at the altar? I, I've got a, a decision I've got to face. Will you pray with me? Pastor, will, will, you, will you give me your advice of what you think about this, what I should do? Or do you just come to church? Just filling a seat on Sunday? on Wednesday, on Monday? Or are you active in your church? See, the church will only go as far as you bring it. What are you talking about, Pastor? That's your job. No, it's not. My job is to feed you. Let me ask you this question, and we'll judge it right now. Have I fed you as a pastor? Okay, so I'm doing my job. Okay, now you fat little sheep, okay, go out there and create other sheep. You've been well fed. You're not starving. You're not hungry. You know how to talk to people. It amazes me. Some people say, well, Pastor, I don't know what to say. How can I say anything? I don't know, what to, I don't know how to approach people. I, I can't approach people. You approach people every day. Oh, but let something on Facebook it's you the wrong way, man. Your opinion is right there.
Amen. Make us a God that we can worship. The 21st philosophy, the, the philosophy of the 21st century church. It's wrong. It's demonic. And it has no place in the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. <laughs> Brother Bob, maybe you can put something on real quiet, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you. It breaks my heart because I know that churches that are forming in different places of the world, like India and Pakistan, that some regions are making it illegal to be converted to another religion and pastors will spend three years in prison if they bring conversion. The door of opportunity is closing. Let us be the church. Let us go out and witness. Talk to people in the supermarkets when you're in line, the person before you, the person behind you. When you do your laundry at the laundromat, Talk to people. Your neighbor downstairs, talk to people. Tell them before it's too late. Your daughter, your son, your cousin, your auntie, your uncle, your brother-in-law, sister-in-law. Not in a judgmental way, but in a loving way. Let them know the times in which we live, that the end is coming upon us. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, the word says. Look at the floods all over the place. God's given us signs. No, not a whole world flood. But as it was in the days of Noah. Flooding unimaginable like we've never seen on, in, in, in a, a lifetime. Violence is on the increase. Lord Jesus, help us to be the church that you call us to be. Help us to not form a God after our own likeness, after what is not of you, Lord. We don't want a false God that we've made according to our image, according to our likeness, made up in our minds. And then go to you and think we can go through that image that we created? No. You are a holy God. You are a righteous God. You are a jealous God. You're a loving and kind God. You're a merciful God. You're a forgiving God. But Lord, let us not emphasize one of those attributes above another. <coughs> Excuse me. Lord, let us <coughs> let us be faithful as your servants in these last days. I thank you and praise you, Lord, that the devil's not going to shut me up. I thank you and praise you that I'm going to speak your word in your way and present you to the best of my ability according to your word. I ask you to bless your people, be with them as we go our separate ways. Bless they're going in, they're coming out, they're lying down, they're rising up. I thank you for their lives. Keep them safe, Lord. Mentally, physically and spiritually. Please, God, don't let them walk out of this door and forget this message. Don't let them walk out of this door and just shrug it off their shoulders, shrug it to the side as just another message. The Lord, speak to their hearts. And let us go. separate ways, blessed by you. In 
in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. <clears throat>